Good morning to each and every one of you and welcome once again to worship on this beautiful and glorious Sunday morning. And this morning I am filled with with so much joy in the fact that we are able to once again gather together as believers in God and to share together in His Holy Word. And this morning it is my prayer that this time that we share together would truly be blessed. And our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 51. And I'm reading from verse 1 to verse 4 and then verse 7 to verse 12. And this is what it says. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Cleanse me with hyssop. And I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones of the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we come before you on this beautiful Sunday morning, this day that you have created to rejoice in your love, to rejoice in your mercy, to rejoice in your grace. Father, we approach your throne this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts, knowing that you are our Lord, knowing that you are our God, the one and only. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, for your blessing upon us this morning, for your blessing upon this time that we get to share together. And yet also, Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation that we have through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he hung on the cross. He bore the punishment that we so rightly deserve. And at his resurrection, Lord, we thank you that your salvific work was completed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as the Holy Spirit moves within us, that we would be sensitive to that, that we would just feel his guiding, that we would feel his counsel with us, that we would hear your voice, and that in all things we would glorify your mighty and holy name. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, our scripture reading comes from one of my favorite books in all of scripture. It comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. And we are reading this morning from Isaiah chapter 42 and from verse 5 through to verse 9. This is what the God, the Lord says. The creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you And will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. 
to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. In this, this beautiful passage this morning, it actually begins um, from verse 1. And the Lord is busy speaking about a, a chosen servant, this, this chosen servant who will be unlike any um, earthly leader. It will be, or he will be rather, unlike any king or, or prophet or servant that the world has seen before. You see, in the ancient world, in order for, for a leader or a king to attain basically anything, these leaders, rulers, kings, um, worldly powers would set out to dominate one another for superiority and for power. And once this domination has taken place, once authority has been established, once um, power is given to one or the other, it is in that moment that we or that, that we would be able to attain those things that we want. You see, the aim is to subdue an opponent to the point where it becomes easy for us to get what we want. There is no um, thought about the consequences. There's no thought about the welfare of human life. And there's no thought for the destruction and devastation that is left behind. And yet, in Isaiah 42, verse 1 to verse 4, that's the beginning, um, four verses of, of this beautiful chapter, this um, chosen servant who will bring about justice for the people of God does not act in the same way as these earthly leaders, these earthly kings, these earthly authorities. In fact, God is promising to his people that justice will come, but it will not come by way of warfare. It will not come by way of destruction, but it will come with gentleness and with mercy. See, this servant, um, the prophet Isaiah says, will not grow weary. This servant will will not grow faint in, in bringing about justice, and that is God's justice, into the world. Nor will the servant be discouraged in carrying out God's plan. This servant, as the prophet Isaiah is prophesying here, is the very Son of God. And through this servant, through um, the Son of God, through the Messiah who is still to come at this point in Israel's history, the nations, this is what he says, the nations will be transformed and biblical justice will prevail. And our passage this morning, verse 5 to verse 9, shows to us why we can rely on this, uh, this promise. It tells us why we can trust in the transformative work of God. You see, he begins with this phrase, Thus says the Lord, or this is what God 
the Lord says. And it is key to our understanding of, of how we relate to this promise of God. It is the Lord who promises. It is the Lord who speaks. It is the Lord who is at work. And it is the Lord who is to fulfill this promise. Thus says the Lord. See, God is not this, this magical being who snaps his fingers and all of a sudden things um, work out for, for us as his people. God is not some mystical being who, who um, transcends life on earth and who we call upon through um, the, the praying to or the worship of these worthless idols because we know that our God, the God whom we serve, is the living God. He is the creator God. He is a covenantal God who is holy and righteous. See, verse 5 and verse 6 speak about this fact that God is the creator of all things. All things that are living, all things that are inanimate, all things that we see around us within creation. It tells us that God is the one who gives breath to all that inhabit the earth, all who inhabit the earth, all living things are given breath by God. That is um, to say that God is the one who breathed life into his creation. And he is the one who gives life to all living things. He has the power to create out of nothing, to destroy what has or what is not pleasing to him. And he has the power to transform that which has already been created. And he promises them to fulfill all that he has planned for his people. This is why we can trust in the power of God and we can trust and hope in the promises of God. Because from this point in Isaiah, back to the beginning of creation, when God speaks, not a word has failed. And likewise for us, we can trust in those same promises. See, Isaiah speaks about the, the calling that God has upon his people. He speaks about the care that God shows towards his people. And he speaks about the, the transforming of their darkness into light. The servant of God that Isaiah is speaking about will set the captives free. This is what he says. He will set the captives free. And those who are living in the dungeon, those who are living in darkness, will be released. Isn't that such an amazing um, expression of who God is. And I'm reminded here of, of one of the, the seven I am sayings. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. See, those who are in Jesus do not walk in darkness. They have been released from that prison. And now with Christ, and with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they walk in light. 
See, of course, Isaiah is speaking about a very specific moment in their history, and he's speaking specifically to those exiles living in Babylon. And yet the image of a physical liberation from Babylon serves also as an image of spiritual liberation that is to come through Christ. And this is the promise of God knowing that Christ Jesus will come and fulfill this promise. And he will transform the hearts and the minds of his people. You see, it's like a, a caterpillar that is um, transforming into a butterfly. There are three specific things that we must understand about the transforming work of God. You see, firstly, like the caterpillar, it does not work to maintain its transformation. In other words, once it is transformed, it remains that way. It doesn't work to stay in that state. It just is. Secondly, like the caterpillar, it does not expend any personal energy within the process of transformation. In other words, the work is done on its own. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, is the fact that like the caterpillar, it merely positions itself, allowing the process of transformation to take place. And so it is with the work of God. So it is with his transformative work in us. You see, transformation does not happen through the accumulation of, of biblical knowledge. And I want to stress here that there is a purpose for biblical knowledge. It is important for us to gather biblical knowledge. But I'll say it again, transformation does not happen with the accumulation of of biblical knowledge because if this was the case then the religious leaders and the teachers of the law would have experienced this transformation that comes through the work of God again I cannot stress this enough in saying that biblical knowledge is important it truly is but I am reminded of the words here of Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't say be transformed by the gathering of knowledge. You see, we have knowledge. We have biblical knowledge of God. But unless we allow God to renew our minds, it is simply knowledge. See, God is the one who illuminates his truth for us. Through his Holy Spirit living in us, God reveals himself to us through his word, through prayer, through worship, and through faith in Christ Jesus, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, you are a new creation. But it is still the work of God. See, the old has gone and the new has come. This is the transformative work of God, not through any works of our own. And as God illuminates his truth for us through the reading and the preaching of his word and through um, aspects of worship like prayer and through the work of the Holy Spirit 
within us, we must then position ourselves like the caterpillar in such a way as to allow the Lord to transform us, to transform our hearts, to transform our minds, to transform our spirits. See, genuine transformation is God achieved and it is God sustained. Isn't that such a beautiful thought for us as believers in Christ Jesus. I'm reminded again of the words of Paul, this time from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, when he says, I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, if we possess Christ in our lives, then transformation will be the, the verification of his indwelling presence with us. And the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in our lives. See, spiritual performance, acting um, like Jesus, is, is basically something that any lost person um, could or would rather be able to do if they set their minds to it. But at the end of the day, it is a performance. At the end of the day, it is merely acting because if we take the knowledge that we have accumulated and we seek to put on this performance, then it is possible for us to look like Jesus. But real transformation is a work of God in us. And it is not of man. And it is only once real transformation takes place that we can truly live our lives in the likeness of Christ. And when we live our lives having been transformed by the power of God, we then exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in us. We are able to exhibit the, the Christ-like features that we are called to exhibit in this life as we become the children of God, as we embody the Spirit of God, and as we trust in the work of God that He is doing within us. And what is then the fruit of the Spirit? How do we truly know and trust that we have been transformed by God or that those whom we are speaking to have been transformed by God? Again, this is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so, dear friends, this morning I want to encourage each of you, and I'm speaking to myself as well, to take a moment to pause in life to evaluate the work of God that is being done in us. Take the fruit of the Spirit and ask yourselves, as I ask myself, are these things evident 
in my life? And have I truly been transformed by the power of God? And if not, I want to encourage you this morning to position yourselves in such a way as to allow the Holy Spirit in and allow him to move in your life that you too may experience the transformative work of God. And may that work become evident in everything that we do as individual people and as a church of God. And so let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you, Lord, for the work that you started through your chosen servant, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he was promised thousands of years ago. We thank you, Lord, that you promised that when he comes, he would bring light into this world, that he would set the captives free, and that he would release your people from the bondage of sin. We thank you, Lord, that through faith in Christ Jesus, this promise is fulfilled for us. And we no longer walk in darkness, but we walk in the light of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that through Christ Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, you are transforming us each and every day into the likeness of Christ. We just pray, Lord, that we would continue to position ourselves in such a way as to allow you to work in us and through us, that you may be glorified in all things. So help us, Lord, to exhibit the, the fruit of the Spirit. May we reflect the glory of Christ in all that we do. And may we hope in the transformative work that you are busy with in us. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that you are faithful in answering our prayers, that you are faithful in all things, and that your grace, your love, and your mercy abounds within us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I announce the benediction, I want to remind you of two beautiful songs for you to go and listen to. If you haven't listened to them already, I want to encourage you this morning to, to just take a moment to worship God in song with us. The first song is Open the Eyes of My Heart, and the second um, is Ancient Words. And I receive the Lord's blessing. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and those whom you love today and always. Amen.